Today we're going to take a look at some CompTIA Network Plus practice questions. If you're curious about the types of things that you may see on the CompTIA Network Plus exam, uh, these cover some of the objectives, of course, not nearly all of them. There's plenty more to discover, but this will be a good start. Let's go ahead and get started with some practice questions coming up right now. So let's go ahead and get started with some practice questions for the CompTIA Network Plus exam. Uh, the older exam right now is the N10006. The next version is the N10-007. Either one you want to take, totally fine. These questions should apply to both of them. If you're looking for other exam questions, I do have some of those on my channel as well, so feel free to check those out. But let's get started with these Network Plus questions. Uh, the format here that I'm going to use is I'm going to give you roughly about 10 seconds per question to kind of think to yourself what the answer might be. And after that 10 second period, we'll go ahead and display the answer and I'll discuss why it's the right answer. We're not just going to show you the right answer. We want to understand why it's that answer. So here we go. Let's go ahead and pull up question one and get started. So question number one, the cable installers for John's new office neglected to label any of the cables coming into the IDF. Which of the following devices could be used to trace which cable belongs to a certain office? So this is kind of like a telecom closet, somewhere that cables come into, they run to patch panels, go out to switches. So we know that a cable tester is going to test to make sure that the cable is actually wired correctly. Making sure that you've got perhaps that T568A or T568B. We can test to see whether it's a valid straight through cable or crossover cable, uh, but we don't really use that in this kind of scenario. We've also got a multimeter. A multimeter tests for things like voltage and amperage. It can test for continuity, and most of them will do both AC and DC power as well. But of course, a multimeter is not really quite what we're looking for here. Uh, option C is a toner and probe. Now this is what we're looking for. The toner and probe, basically the toner is kind of a little small box that has a ethernet port on it. You plug that up to say the jack in an office or at a cubicle, and it's going to basically send a signal down that cable. Some people call this a fox and a hound. But once we plug that toner up, we'll take the probe over to our telecom closet and basically kind of probe around through those individual cables. And when we reach the cable that the signal is coming through, it will start making a noise. Now, the last option here is an RF analyzer. This can be used for things like measuring the Wi-Fi signal in a certain location, or it can be used for, uh, in the cable industry, we plug it up to coax cables and can actually see how much signal is coming down that cable. But we don't really need that in this scenario either. We are looking for answer C. This is our toner and probe. So let's move on to question number two. So Jason is trying to connect to a Windows server using a remote desktop connection. However, the firewall appears to be blocking the connection. Which port does Jason need to open on the firewall? Well, port 14 for 33 is going to be for our Microsoft SQL server. Uh, port 1819, I have no idea what that is, just a random number that I went ahead and made up. Port 3389, we know is for the remote desktop protocol. So that's the one we're actually looking for here. Uh, it is a Microsoft proprietary connection. Uh, last one here, 3933, again, just another random number that I threw in there. So 3389, though, is the one that we want to use. So let's go ahead and move on to question number three. So Kay has been tasked with making patch cables to connect from the wall outlets to the docking stations or computers in all the new offices. What type of connector does she most likely need to purchase in bulk to accomplish this task? Well, we know that RJ11 is used for analog telephone lines. It basically has the capability of accepting four wires. RJ45 is the type of connector that we use on an Ethernet cable. It has the capability of accepting eight wires. This is the Category 5, Category 6, 6A, and so on that we typically are going to use for things like Ethernet. So RJ45 is what she wants to purchase. Now, B and C is a type of connector for coax, so we're not going to be using B and C. And the last one, HDMI, of course, we use for audio and video connections in a high-definition format. So we're not really looking for that here either. So this is going to be B, RJ45. So let's go ahead and move on to question number four. So 
So question number four, Leroy is unable to establish a connection to a remote server. He thinks the issue may be that a router is down, but is unsure which one. Which command could he run from a Linux server to figure out where the issue might be? Well, we know that ping is going to tell us what the round trip time is in milliseconds for that connection, right? It's not going to tell us specifically what router is down. However, we do want to run a trace route, but the trick here is you need to know which trace route command he needs to run. Now on Windows, we actually run kind of an abbreviated version of the, the word here, and it's just trace RT. However, the question asked from a Linux server, well, Unix, Linux, and Macs all actually use the full word trace route. In fact, Cisco routers and switches also use the word trace route, all written out, T-R-A-C-E-R-O-U-T-E. -E. So we actually want to use option C here, the full word trace route. Now the last one, NS lookup, is name server lookup. This is not going to help us trace down where a router might be between us and some other endpoint on the network. So this answer is going to be C, trace route. So if you got that one correct, very good. So we'll go ahead and move on to question number five. So question five, company XYZ is going to try letting some customer service representatives work from home. Which of the following would the IT department need to set up for these employees? Well, we know that a VPN is a virtual private network. Essentially, we're going to tunnel through the internet connecting to the company's network and it will actually treat their connection exactly as if they were sitting in the office, allowing them to do their job from home. Now, B, MVNO, this is a mobile virtual network operator, so this is not going to work either. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. This is basically when a small company wants to sell wireless service, but they don't want to build out a cellular network. So they're basically almost kind of reselling service from, say, Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T or, or some other carrier. So option number C is VLAN. This is a virtual local area network. This is a way that we can kind of segment our traffic within a network, but that's not really what we're looking to do here. We're not looking to separate our traffic. We're looking to let people work from home. Again, that's a virtual private network, not a virtual local area network. Option D, a virtual switch. Now, when we're working with virtual servers, such as VMware or Oracle's VirtualBox or whatever other platform, Microsoft's Hyper-V, we may use a virtual switch with these virtual machines to define what they're allowed to connect to, including things like assigning a VLAN to them. But again, a virtual switch is not going to be the correct option here. We are looking for that virtual private network or VPN option A. So let's go ahead and move to question number six. So a company makes the decision to switch to voice over IP and goes out and purchases 100 new VoIP phones. However, once they plug the phone into the Ethernet cable at employees' desks, the phone does not turn on. What critical feature is most likely missing on their switch? Well, we know that switches don't really use too much TCP IP at this point, right? We may have an IP address assigned to the a VLAN interface on there, but the primary job of a switch is to actually forward packets based on the MAC address. So we're not really looking at that. And either way, the phone turning on isn't going to depend upon TCP IP. It's going to need some sort of a power source, right? So TCP IP doesn't provide our power. Layer three routing, again, layer three routing does not provide a power source to our phones. VLAN, virtual local area network, I know we just described that just a moment ago. These aren't going to help us either. But option D, PoE, this is our power over ethernet. This is delivering a small DC voltage through your ethernet cable to whatever the end device is. You can use it for things like voice over IP phones, but you can also use it for things like IP cameras or various other types of devices as well. This is what we need to make sure that that phone is actually going to get power and turn on. The last option here, IPsec. IP security really has nothing to do with providing power to phones as well. It can be used for things like delivering secure connections over our networks, but it's not going to provide power. So let's go ahead and move on to question number seven. So which of the following is a valid MAC address? Well, we know that MAC addresses are 48 bits long, right? They're divided up into six groups, the first half of which is our OUI, or Organizationally Unique Identifier. The last half of it basically is our interface ID, but this is a number that is based in hexadecimal. The hexadecimal 
is 0 through 9 and A through F. I know most of us are used to the decimal numbering system, which is just 0 through 9, but of course hex is 6, dec is 10, so 6 plus 10 is a base 16 mathematical system. So when we're looking down through these, we can immediately eliminate option A because it has a G in there. We don't go through G with hexadecimal. We also know that with 48 bits, it breaks it into six groups of two characters each. So when we look at options C and D, there's only five groups of two characters. So C and D cannot be correct either. So the only option that works here is going to be option B. This is a potentially valid MAC address. So let's move to question number eight. So how many bits are there in an IPv6 address? Well, we know that in an IPv4 address, there's 32 bits. We weren't looking for an IPv4 address, we were looking for IPv6. We also just talked about that MAC addresses have 48 bits, correct? But there's not 48 bits in an IPv6 address. There are, however, 128 bits in an IPv6 address. So option C is going to be our correct answer here. Option D, 256 bits. No, there are some things that use 256 bits, such as different types of encryption, but we're not looking for different types of encryption. We're looking for how many bits there are in an IPv6 address, and that is 128, option C. So let's go ahead and move on to question number nine. So which of the following is a valid automatically assigned IP address in the case that the computer is unable to establish a connection to a DHCP server? Well, we know that when a computer joins a network, if it's configured for DHCP, it's going to send out a broadcast asking who the DHCP server is. If it does not receive a response, essentially what happens is that it's going to go through its own little process called a PIPA, or a PIPA, however you want to pronounce it. It's A-P-I-P-A. And this is an automatic private IP address. Now, these IP addresses always start with 169.254, and they use a default subnet mask for that class B range of 255.255.0.0. So when we look at these IP addresses down through here, we see that option A, 172.30.40.50, that of course is a class B private IP address, but it's not an automatic private IP address or a PIPA address. Option B is a class A private IP address. Anything that starts with the number 10 is a class A private IP address, but it is also not the APIPA or APIPA IP address. Option C starts with 169.254. That is a valid address for the automatic private IP addressing scheme. Option D is 192.168. That is the range that we use for our class C private IP addresses. So that also is not going to work. So the correct answer for number nine is only going to be C. So let's go ahead and move on to our last question for this set, question number 10. So which of the following connectors is a type of connector used on a fiber optic cable? Well, we know that A, the BNC connector is going to be a coax connector. B, an F connector, is also a type of coax connector. RJ45 is a type of Ethernet connector used on twisted pair. But option D is a type of fiber connector, and you do want to know the different types of fiber connectors. All of these connectors are in the objectives from CompTIA, so you do want to make sure that you know your connectors for the CompTIA Network Plus exams. So I hope you found these questions helpful in studying for your CompTIA Network Plus exam. If you happen to be studying for any other exams, such as the Security Plus or the Cisco CCNA, I know that there's a lot of material that this exam does cover. So be sure to check out some of my other videos. I do have plenty of other videos on a lot of different networking and security topics, and I'll be continuing to make more of those over time as well. So if you haven't subscribed already, be sure to join all those others who have already done so and click on that subscribe button for me. If you've got any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments below. Click on that like button or thumbs up and stay tuned. I'll try and get another video up here very soon. But in the meantime, thanks for watching. You guys take care. We'll see you soon.